Today is a very special day, the first Sunday of February, February 5th. And what is today famous for at Bell Road Baptist Church? Super Bowl, right? Yeah, Lord's Supper. Yeah, and we'll get to Super Bowl. Last week, I mentioned that uh, Super Bowl means absolutely nothing to me. I have never watched a Super Bowl game my entire life. Now, I've gone through the room and looked at it a little bit, maybe sat down for six or seven minutes, but I've just never gotten connected with Super Bowl. But it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with Super Bowl. I'm sure there's some people who are praying heavy about their call from Jesus Christ in life to play on one of these teams, the, uh, uh, the Giants and the Patriots. Is that? No, Patriots, yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure that for somebody, let's bring the screen down, Daniel. For somebody, um, and maybe for a great number of people, Super Bowl is the way that they're able to sing that hymn that we sang. Lord, uh, take my hands and let them move. For the Christian who is called and gifted to excel in this area of life, sports, football, to, to, to sing that hymn at church on a Sunday morning, Lord, take my hands and make them move, might be like the way I sang the, the last verse. Lord, take my blank and make it your throne. Now, you all sang it with me. Lord, take my what and make it your throne. Okay, I heard somebody say what? Playing? Blank? Oh, blank. Yeah, okay. Give me. Now, I could call our worship leader up here because he knows it, obviously. Right, John? Lord, take my what? What? Did you say art? Heart? Will. Will. Yes, it's will. He got it. Lord, take my will and make it your throne. Now, do you see... Some of you are going colorblind. Can you see the, the bright yellow love up here? Can you see it? Or are you going colorblind? If your eyes aren't real sharp, you probably can't see that at all. We came in today and turned on the bulb, and we've lost one of the flavors of color that create the total spectrum. But I'm still going to preach off this as through a glass darkly. I remember being a kid and hearing some program on the radio as we were driving a long distance. And I'm really into this program, and then we start to get some interference. That's the way it was back in the radio days. If you got out of the distance, out of the uh, transmitter range, you'd start to hear interference and maybe even another station come in and collide with the station you're listening to. And I noticed I had to listen extra careful. And because of the interference, and because it caused me to listen extra careful, I listened with much more attention. So today I ask you, how do you love Jesus? Previously on our schedule, it had been appointed to sing, Oh, how I love Jesus. And I thought, well, I'm just going to take the title of that song and make it the title of our message. Then the song got changed. And I decided, well, no, I already prayed about this. We're going to just keep this message. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because I think sometimes I'm singing, oh, how I love Jesus. And I'm doing anything but loving Jesus. Because I got my mind divided. I'm thinking about other things. So I want to ask you today, before we share the Lord's Supper, and before our worship team gets up to invite us to join our hands, our feet, our will with theirs. Before that, I want to ask you, are you going to be serious? Are you going to put all distractions aside and tune in? I mean, totally lock in to the message of love for God. Now, on the map, we saw that Paul had spent two years in Caesarea in the book of Acts. And then he took this trip to get up to Rome. When he had landed at Puteoli, the brothers in Rome had heard that we were coming, and they traveled as far as the Forum of Appius and the Three Taverns to meet us. So they set out by foot and walked on the Appian Way to meet up with Paul. When we got to Rome, 
Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. Now, the Bible doesn't say anything more about this, but we know there's just one soldier to guard Paul, and Paul will be in Rome for two years, just as he was in Caesarea for two years. And I put forth one theory that Paul wrote the letter to the Philippians from Caesarea during those two years, because we know that people were allowed to come and go and visit him and bring him what he needed. He had a level of freedom in chains in Caesarea, but he's still a prisoner. In Rome, he's allowed to live by himself, but he has a soldier to guard him. And some of you, if you dug into your uh, Bible study notes really deep, it would say that the, the custom for being guarded by one man would be to be chained to that guard. Now, the Bible doesn't say that, and I don't know if that's really the case, but I want to take a good look at this. Um, Tim, would you come on up here with Micah? All right. These guys have been friends for a long time, so they don't mind me putting them on the spot with this. Now, let's just say that this old guy is Paul, and you're the Roman guard assigned to guard him. Now, the custom is you're supposed to be chained to him, and I'm, I'm guessing maybe, maybe it's a chain from the wrist. Maybe it's a chain from the foot or ankle. You guys are the experts on this, but how close do you want to be to him? I think you're the one possibly in charge here. How much leeway are you going to give him on that chain? You're going to guard him possibly for a two-year stint. <laughs> it, <laughs> Seriously, just that much? You could put him on a tether where you're, you just say, you just stay over there, I'll stay over here. Okay, okay thanks, guys. I just wanted to get across this point that your Bible study notes possibly will say that they're chained together. I don't know. It's house arrest. I don't really know. But I want to think about the limitation of Paul's freedom. I mean, he's already a prisoner of the government, but to have to be in close proximity to one guard. Now, if that guard became a brother in the Lord, the Scripture doesn't say that he has, but over two years' time, what sorts of conversations might take place? What might happen? I just want you to think about that because I don't want to go over two years' time in just a few verses of God's Word. Paul was allowed to live by himself, and we'll know if we were to read further that he was there for two years in Rome at this point in time. Three days later, he called together the leaders of the Jews. When they had assembled, Paul said to them, okay, let's just stop here for a second. Everywhere Paul goes, the Jews are stirred up against him. Everywhere he goes. But now he's gone clear off, halfway to Spain. And he's in Rome, and he's in Rome for the first time as a Christian, we believe. And all he has to go on is what he's experienced in the past. He's been rather notorious in every city where he's gone, and he goes first to the Jews, and they try to stone him. They stir up controversy against him. And the whole reason he's arrested is because of the Jews stirring up trouble for him in Jerusalem. But when he gets to Rome, he calls upon the leaders of the Jews. And they came when they had assembled three days later. Paul says to them, My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people, or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. But when the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, not that I had any charge to bring against my own people. For this reason, I have asked to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. And in this case, this chain means the whole reason I am stuck with this guy. You know, I get to live by myself, but I, I'm under constant watch. And the custom is to be chained to him. 
But it's because of the hope of Israel that I have submitted myself, that I have allowed my freedom to be limited on this earthly plane. It's because of the hope of Israel that I've called upon you and asked to see you and talk with you. Now, what is the hope of Israel? The correct answer, boys and girls, is Jesus. Okay? It is. That's the correct answer. It's because of Jesus that I am bound with this chain. He's calling upon the people who ought to be the most excited about the message of Jesus. But instead, generally speaking, Jesus has been rejected as the hope of Israel. They're looking for something more different than Jesus. So Paul takes one more opportunity to testify, to witness. And I believe it's because of his love for Jesus. What is the first and greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your mind, all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And the second commandment is like the first. And love your neighbor as yourself. First love God, and then love your neighbor. This is love for his neighbors, prompted by sent by his love for God. It is because of Jesus that I am bound with this chain. So here's something practical for you. If you are chained up in some way, and it might look like it's going to be a couple years, put yourself in Paul's place. You don't need to moan and groan about the limitations placed upon your freedom. I took care of a brother with multiple sclerosis for a few years. And I had to watch the rest of the world go by. A lot of other people coming and going with great amounts of freedom. But I was limited by my love for Jesus. There were no legal constraints. There was no legal responsibility I had for my brother. It was because I love God. And God had called me to take care of my brother. To look out for his needs. And in sometimes, if I was humble enough before God, sometimes... I actually placed my brother's needs before my own, my brother's concerns before my own. And I got to taste and see that God's way is the best. God's way is good. Later, I read in a book by Rick Warren, he was talking about somebody's station in life, what somebody's circumstances call them to. They still get to go to the final destination. They still get to enjoy all the fruit of the Holy Spirit, but their freedom in Christ looks different than somebody else who seems to have all kinds of freedom, but maybe is not as close in their love relationship with God as the one who is bound by their circumstances for perhaps a couple years or perhaps the rest of one's life. Paul isn't hopeless. He calls upon supposed enemies. He calls upon the kinds of people who had stoned him in the past. He calls upon these kinds of people because of his love for Jesus. Now, this is so interesting, how we can get carried away with our vain imaginations. Well, what will happen if I do this? In response to Paul, they replied, we've not received any letters from Judea concerning you. And none of the brothers who have come from there has reported or said anything bad about you. <laughs> in other words, if Paul had been really worked up in his vain imaginations, he would have been totally off base. He's a nobody. They haven't been waiting for him. We haven't heard anything bad about you. But we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. There is nothing new under the sun. You are an ambassador of Jesus, and people are talking about Jesus. And there are people talking against Jesus, and speaking against Jesus and his church. But that doesn't mean that they've fallen for it all. They're aware of it. But there's a group of people, there's an individual 
who would be interested in hearing more. We want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. Now in June, it's in your bulletin, Louis Palau is going to come to Sacramento, Lord willing. And for two days, on a Saturday afternoon into the evening, on a Sunday afternoon into the evening, there are going to be thousands of Christians who have prepared a place for large numbers to come to hear more about Jesus. This is not Spirit West Coast, where you pay $20 a pop to go hear the Christian bands. That's Christian entertainment for Christians. This is evangelistic outreach, and it's offered for free. And some of those bands that you might pay $20 to go see will be playing there, probably for free, because they want to share the opportunity and the platform and to testify about what Jesus means to them. And we get invited to be part of this for two days in June. A man who had as a great goal in his life to come to America to meet Billy Graham and to work for Billy Graham, and he did. And Billy Graham ministered to the next generation and opened some doors for him to also have that opportunity to preach to large crowds of people. If God wasn't in it, it wouldn't be happening. But I'm guessing there's going to be thousands of people there who, for whatever reason, simply said, yeah, okay, I'll go. You know what? I have never watched a Super Bowl game in my life, but I am going to watch the Super Bowl today because somebody invited me. I don't really even have an interest in it, but the person who invited me has consistently been kind to me, and he just happens to be a Christian. I don't know if he's going to try to, you know, brainwash me with a bunch of religious stuff once I get there, using the Super Bowl to get me there. I'm just going to go because he's been kind to me. Well, these people arrived in even larger numbers to the place where Paul was staying. And I love this. From morning till evening, one day, from morning till evening, he explained and declared to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and the prophets. Now, Jennifer, I put some blanks up there. Can you see the blanks? That means that if you've got a Bible, you can look up this very verse, Acts 28, 23, and you can see what words were used for the first blank. From morning till evening, he expounded, he explained, he exhibited. If you were in a courtroom and you were going to expound upon a case at hand, you would say, I draw your attention to Exhibit A, Exhibit B. Exhibit C, he explained, he broke it down, and he testified, he declared to them the kingdom of God. Now, I know today we are going to sing a song called Majesty. When I first got saved, I, I already played guitar from the old days, before Christ, and I went to this retreat, and they saw I had a guitar, and they said, can you play Majesty? I'd never heard of Majesty. I pull the guitar out, they start singing Majesty, and I find out what key it's in, and it's a very simple little one, four, five kind of song. Majesty. Kind of corny, I thought, melodically. It was not exactly rock music, but it was a bunch of people being nice to me, Christians, a new group of people. And they had a whole new bunch of songs. Now today, we are going to sing a song called Majesty, but it's not that old song. It's a a different majesty song. But I wonder if it's going to have anything to do with the kingdom of God. You see, I didn't grow up in a royal setting. I don't know what it is to have a king or a queen. I don't know what it is to have that sovereign rule over a nation. 
And so when I first heard majesty as a person out of the world, into the church, can you sing this? Can you play this? It didn't mean much to me. And frankly, I have yet to attain to a real understanding of what it is to have my will conformed to the will of my king. Majesty. The first song talked of majesty, a throne. Lord, take my will and make my will your throne. Lord, in other words, I'm going to be so low that I want you to sit on me, reign in me. Lord, let your church be your throne and reign in us. Let us be your footstool, O oh Lord, our God, our King, our majestic King, Prince of Peace. From morning till evening, this is not a 20-minute exposition. This is an all-day event. From morning till evening, he explained and declared to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses, and from the prophets. So there are three words to expound, to place, or set out, to set up, to exhibit, to set forth. To testify, to witness, to solemnly affirm, to cause it to be believed. That's the job of the attorney, isn't it? The whole reason you lay out exhibit A, B, and C. Because you want to finally convince somebody based upon your persuasive speech or your persuasive life. Convince or persuade. From morning till evening, we laid out the exhibits. We testified. We tried to persuade. These men who say they believe in the kingdom of God. We tried to persuade to them that the Messiah in this kingdom, the Savior in this kingdom, the Prince of Peace, the suffering servant, is Jesus. We tried to persuade them. We it always kind of was weird when I heard the preacher say we. It's Paul and the Holy Spirit living in him. Paul being used, his feet being used to go as beautiful feet wherever the Holy Spirit prompts him to go. His mouth being moved when he opens his mouth before important people to trust that if he's been in the Word if he's been in prayer, if he's in relationship with God the Father, that when he speaks about God the Son, the Holy Spirit God will give him what to say. And for this audience, we don't need the Super Bowl, we don't need the popular songs on the radio station. For this particular audience, let's stick to the law and the prophets. Let's stick to the the stuff they're already interested in. See, if, if all they're interested in is Super Bowl, that might be where you want to start. If all they're interested in is this music group, Wilco, then start with Wilco. Start with, there was an old one, Nirvana. Start where they're at. Today, did you hear somebody yell out, Yeehaw! Because the guitar player starts doing a somewhat pseudo-country lick. I mean, he's no Brad Paisley or anything. But he tried. He tried to connect with a, with a very small contingent of country lovers. Anybody here love country western music? Look at this, John. <laughs> so how'd he do with his little country lick in Vic Victory of Jesus, huh? <laughs> All right. Well, it, John, it wasn't exactly a yeehaw, but I tried to help you out up there, all right? 
In this case, Paul started with the law of Moses and the prophets. You see, Paul can and did testify before the Stoic and Epicurean philosophers on Mars Hill. And he used their songs, whether it's country, heavy metal, polka. Paul would use what he needed to use, but in this sense, he knows the Word of God. It's not because he doesn't know the Word of God. He knows the Word of God very well. And in this case, from morning till evening, he explains, he testifies about the kingdom of God and tries to persuade them about Jesus. And now look at this. Some were convinced, and that's a blessing, by what he said. But others, even after an entire day, but others would not believe. Now what we're about to do here, the sharing of the bread and the cup, this is for those who are convinced. If you are of the group that have yet to come to believe, have yet to be convinced or persuaded, then when the bread is passed to you, let it pass. If the cup is offered to you, let it go by. It's not for you. This is for the convinced. This is for the born-again Christian, the one who has admitted that you're a sinner and have called upon the name of Jesus to forgive your sin and have believed that Jesus' death on a cross paid for all your sin. And if you have not come to that point, you should not eat this bread or drink this cup. How do you love Jesus? I love Jesus by taking the Lord's Supper when it's offered to me. Not because I'm worthy. I am not worthy. This is a free gift to me. Regularly, I hear the rehearsal of Jesus' words. This is my body. Take and eat. This do in remembrance of me. This is my blood. It's the blood of a new covenant. Take and drink in remembrance of me. I'm not worthy, but I receive this as a free gift. This is what makes me worthy, my faith, my belief. I'm just a sinner. I could never clean myself up enough to get to this table. I have to rely upon my love relationship with the Lord, and he's the one that offers it to me as a free gift. Take, eat, drink. And when they come, are we going to sing all in all today? And are we going to sing majesty? And are we going to sing I have a hope? And what about reign in us? You know, reign in us, I, I texted some worship team people over the last few days. I said, what songs from Thursday night stick in your head? Christy came back to me, all in all. First one, right back within a few minutes. All in all, the very next morning, she texted me back. All in all. And then later, as we talked about it a little more, she said, actually, the song is really on my heart is, I have a hope. And then Micah submits, rain in us. And a, within a minute, were you guys in the same room? Micah, Brandon? Within a minute, Brandon comes in, rain in us. These guys are in two different geographical locations, but rain in us. Then John chimes in, all in all and rain in us. Nobody said majesty, but for me, for me, I better sing majesty with all my heart uh, as long as the words are good. I don't know. I don't know this new majesty. I know we've sung it here before. Here I am, humbled by your majesty. Covered by your grace, so I'm free. Here I am, knowing I'm a sinful man, covered by the blood of the Lamb. Majesty, your grace has found me just as I am. Empty-handed, but alive in your hands. Here I am, humbled by the love that you gave me. Humbled by the love that you give, forgiven, so that I can forgive. Here I stand, knowing that I'm your desire. Sat, sanctified by glory and fire. Now I've found the greatest love of all is mine. Since you laid down your life, the greatest sacrifice. How do I love Jesus? I love Jesus by loving this guy. My 20-year-old worship leader. I mean, how old was I when he was born? Come on. And yet he's, he's going he's gonna to lead me today? You bet. He's going to lead me because this is his ministry before us, sitting here on this wobbly 
chair. Have you fixed this yet, Mr. Safety? Be careful, John. Be careful out there. And then I put there, in, in addition to eating and drinking as a Christian today, in addition to loving the Lord by singing all in all with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength, my hands, my feet, my will, and all these other beautiful songs, I'm going to go to the Super Bowl out of love for Jesus. I'm going for no other reason. I don't care about I can get Doritos at home. If I want wings, I guess wings are a popular Super Bowl food. We can just go to the Rayleigh's and get some wings and go home. Go out to the park and enjoy God's creation. But I'm going to watch the Super Bowl expecting that God will meet me right there in that place. Then maybe at the gym. In the locker room during the days ahead, somebody will talk about the winners, whoever they happen to be. And I'm going to have some frame of reference, maybe even in that frame of reference. I won't have to say, oh, I've never been to a Super Bowl game before, like I'm some holy Joe. And I'm going to say, yeah, I'm right down there in the slime with y'all, eating the wings and the Doritos. I'm sorry. I'm just. <laughs> so let us bring our servants to the table. Let's get serious here. Paul said, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. Paul had already written this letter. By the time he's in Rome for the, new, the next two year stint, he's already written this letter to the Corinthians. So he, this, is, this is stuff he already knows a whole lot about. He's already re passed this on. And now he passes it on today to us afresh. Paul says, I received from the Lord what I also have passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this. Whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me, a man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you testify, you exhibit, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. See, there might be an unbeliever among us and I want you, unbeliever, to be free to let the bread pass, to let the cup pass. But if you notice that the, the cup is passing by somebody, that's their sign to you, I do not yet believe. And that's okay. That's where I was once. It's our job as a church to explain what these elements mean and why we do what we do.
Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you uh, that you are a substitute for us, Lord, that you who knew no sin, Lord, you took our sins upon you, that you sacrificed yourself for so many people, even some that would never believe. Lord, we uh, remember what you've done for us, and we look forward to the future, Lord, that because you died and and you rose again, that uh, we have a future in you. We thank you for the hope that you give us in our lives, and we thank you for the sacrifice that you became for us, Lord. In Jesus' name. As the cup is passed, we ask that you wait until all have been served, then we'll pray together and drink together. Heavenly Father, we just want to pause to remember how much your grace covers our sin. And Lord, without the shedding of blood, Lord, to cover our sins, Lord, we'd still be in darkness and have no newness, a new life in Christ, Lord. And Father, there's life in the blood. And Lord, we just live by faith and trust in you, Lord. Ezel sent me a picture on my phone of being stabbed this last week. It's bloody and a hundred stitches. It just reminds me, Lord, that in us is blood. And Lord, you shed your blood on the cross. And then, Lord, you had communed with your Father since you were born and in the heavenlies, Lord. And, and then you turned away. And you said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Lord, what a moment that is. What a penalty that is to be alone, separated from God. And Lord, I just pray that, Lord, we examine our hearts and know what that grace and that love really means. That we may go and give a reason for the hope that's in us and have a story to tell of the good news of Christ. Lord, open the doors for us because we have received love and your sacrifice on the cross of your shedding of your blood. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <laughs>